one chapter of the Washington Native Plant Society is on the territorial lands of um, the Coast Salish. And um, we like to acknowledge them as our very early first uh, enthusiasts for native plants. And um, I'm sure tonight we'll be learning more about some of their area with our talk on um, the Nisqually watershed. Um, I, also this picture that is showing is the um, front cover for the Washington Native Plant Society's calendar for 2021. And Denise just uh, shared with me that um, Wednesday is the last day to order uh, in order to get it before the holidays. So think about um, getting your orders in. It's a really beautiful calendar. And um, I especially love this lovely bird. It's, a, it's kind of a fun um, to see the native plants and the birds uh, in their um, sharing habitat. That's very cool. Um, the, tonight's talk will be recorded uh, or it, it is being recorded right now. And in order to get to the recordings, you can go to the WNPS website and click on get involved. And then in that section, there's uh, virtual presentations and you'll find it there and it's um, listed, I think by date. So look for it there. I also encourage you to look at not only our calendar, but at the partner calendar. Uh, the other day, I checked out the partner calendar and realized I had missed seeing something I would have been interested in going to. So please do check out both calendars. So tonight, um, I'm just gonna introduce Jeff and, um, and then we will have his talk and he wants questions at the end. So enter him in the chat and then I'll review them at the end with him and we can, um, get your questions answered. Um, and then uh, Deb Naslin, who's going to be our chapter chair for next year, she's gonna show some slides of a hike that they did uh, at the Goat Rocks. So as I recall, if you're top of Mount Rainier, you can look across and see the Goat Rocks just right next door. So we're gonna have uh, two neighbors uh, chatting with each, or, or two talks about two neighboring uh, areas in our cascades. And um, then at the uh, end, I will open up and everyone can share and um, chat. So you'll be able to have your mics and your cameras on at the very end. Um, next month's speaker, um, it will have uh, Scott Freeman and um, he's gonna share his um, family's project of restoring um, Tarbu Creek. And it's, um, his family is um, four generations of uh, restoration, people involved in restoration. And so I think it'll be really cool to see, um, to hear from him on that transition of, of passing from generation to generation and also the work they did on Tarbu Creek. So um, onward with Jeff's talk tonight, it's gonna be a virtual field trip uh, on the Nisqually watershed. And um, so we'll get, a, we'll get a little opportunity to go on a field trip, which I love that concept. Um, after college, um, Jeff worked summers at Mount Rainier where he fell in love with the mountain and has hiked all the, the trails and um, he's summited. And so just had a deep uh, a love of the mountain. And I'm sure that will be reflected in his talk tonight. Um, he also was a um, professor at Evergreen uh, State College. He taught um, Native American studies, natural history, and environmental education. And he's um, retired recently in the last five years, five years ago, I guess, um, but still very uh, involved in um, sharing and uh, and educating. So we really appreciate that. So Jeff, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and then you'll be able to uh, All right. do that. Hey, everybody. Good evening. 
Good, all right. Uh, I'll uh, share my screen in just a moment. Let me let me make a little eyeball contact with y'all. Hey, good evening and welcome. Great to be with you. Gail, thanks so much for reaching out and inviting me to uh, spend some time with you folks tonight and to lead a field trip. Uh, thank you to Denise for doing the behind the scenes uh, tech work. Really appreciate that too. So yeah, that's that's the job tonight. Uh, let's take a let's take a little trip together. So uh, lace up your hiking shoes and uh, grab a day pack with some snacks on it, and uh, get onto the bus. And uh, let's let's get started. Um, so as you uh, have heard already, uh, we're going to take a trip in the, in the Squally watershed, and. Um, most of the material tonight that I'm going to share with you is in chapter three in my natural history of Mount Rainier National Park. It's called Tahoma and its people. It was published this spring by Washington State University Press. And you probably know that Tahoma is one of several Native American names for the mountain. And if you'd like to know more about that, uh, as Gail said, just put uh, a question in the chat feature and we can get to that uh, at the end of the talk when we do the question and answer session, all right? Um, again, super happy to be with you. Let's just go ahead and get started. Uh, first things first, I always like to give some recognition to two groups of people that were really important uh, in my formative years and in my uh, research for uh, Tahoma and its people. And uh, many years ago, before I even started the book, I was invited onto Indian reservations in Western Washington at Muckleshoot, at Nisqually, at Quinault and others. And there, uh, people were very kind to me. <laughs> and they, um, they let me study uh, the Lashootsi language. And I'm not an expert, but I did study uh, under my teacher, Donna Starr at Muckleshoot. Uh, this is the original language of Puget Sound country or one of the very few first tongues uh, Lashootsi. I'm learning to speak Hulshootsi, which is a Southern dialect. Hello, friend. And because of their willingness to befriend me, uh, folks also took me into the forest and taught me how to harvest red cedar bark. And maybe they knew that I had a good strong back and was free labor. But anyway, they uh, also uh, taught me how to work with bark a bit. I've done a little bit of weaving. And some of these things I think really gave me the ability to learn their stories and to tell the stories of their ancestors uh, over the ages at Tahoma. The other group of folks are with the National Park Service, particularly scientists and staff at Mount Rainier National Park. These are the folks that drug me onto glaciers to help take measurements that had me follow them up to Alpine lakes. And some of these lakes don't even have trails. <laughs> they don't even have names, they have numbers. Uh, and help me learn about the aquatic ecology of uh, the high country. Uh, I learned how to uh, sort through soils in search of archeological finds, stone tool artifacts, these and a whole other, just scores of projects that park staff were kind enough to invite me to come along on. And I think actually, I think they're, their special trick was we would meet at the trailhead and then they would say, oh, hey, Jeff, by the way, can you carry this? And they'd usually give me a big heavy piece of equipment to schlep around all day. But so many stories and so much that I learned from them. And I think if you read Tahoma, you'll find many stories in there that appeal to you. But for tonight, let's just narrow it down to the Nisqually River watershed. Now, this is a shot of the upper watershed. We're looking up toward the mountain from Rick Secker Point within Mount Rainier National Park. Of course, you see the Nisqually River floodplain, uh, center of the photograph. You see the Nisqually Bridge uh, go heading up or down up to Paradise or down to Longmire. And you can think of tonight's talk as kind of being from Alpine Heights to Salish Sea. We're going to kind of follow the Nisqually River that length, or uh, since we're with the Washington Native Plant Society tonight, you might think of this as a trip from, uh, you know, Alaska yellow cedar and mountain hemlock down to pickleweed and twinberry, so to speak. So uh, let's get started and let's get a big picture look. Let's take a look at the watershed itself first. And in just a couple of minutes, we will begin at the origin of the river, the, the terminus or the tongue of the 
Nisqually Glacier. And we're going to follow it, the 78 river miles through the valley, get lots of stories along the way, and end at uh, where the river runs into Puget Sound, into the Salish Sea, at Billy Frank Jr. Nisqually National Wildlife Refuge. But before we get started on the trip, as Gail alluded to, we really need to uh, give some recognition and pay some respect to the original people of this watershed. And in the language, in Lushootsee, they would be called Duh Squally Opsh, Duh Squally Opsh, the Nisqually people, people of the grass, people of the river. Uh, as near as they know and we know, uh, they have lived in that watershed for thousands of years. And although there are no known year-round villages of Nisqually people within the present boundaries of Mount Rainier National Park that we know of, we can still take a look at some of the important ancient ancestral Nisqually villages. There's actually a village not far from Longmire, just outside the park boundary. There was a village uh, near the current town of Elby. There was a large and important Nisqually village that would be just below where the Alder Dam is today. The village of Michelle is important for a variety of reasons, one of which is the people who came from that village, including Leshai, the noted Nisqually orator and leader. And this village is really important on Muck Creek, also called Dog Salmon Creek, because it was the home of Willie Frank. Now, this was the, the father of Billy Frank Jr. And Willie ended up being a fantastic human cultural bridge between the 19th and the 20th century, because he was willing to work with ethnographers and anthropologists. And much of what we know comes from what Willie had shared with these researchers. And then down at the mouth of the, of the Nisqually, a couple of villages on either side of the river mouth. So as I said, we don't know of any year round villages within park boundaries, but there's at least one uh, really important summer camping spot uh, that's within the Nisqually watershed and was probably used by ancestors of present day Nisqually people. If you have ever been to the Coutts Creek picnic area at Mount Rainier, you're just a few miles away from this spot. And if you have ever hiked up to Indian Henry's hunting ground from Coutts Creek, you've been just a couple of hundred yards from this spot. So evidence indicates that uh, people have been going up to this site for over 7,000 years in the summer when the snows you know, had melted back. People would come up here, even in family groups, set up camp in order to procure resources that they did not have access to near their lowland villages. Now, a couple of things to point out here quickly in this photo. The expert, now retired, this is Greg Bircher, who the park archaeologist, was so important in the development of the park's archaeological record. Would you please notice he's the only person doing any work here? He's actually in a unit, and most of the rest of us, including yours truly, hands on hips, just observing and supervising. But as I said, Greg added dozens of sites to the park's record and did created some models that helped us understand where and when people went to the mountain. Really some important work. Here's another shot at the same site. Uh, and this is important because in the background here is Ben Diaz, who is now the park archaeologist, and Ben continues as the tribal liaison with local tribes involving them in projects. So what kind of things do people find? What do we find at these excavations? Well, here a couple of students are excavating a fire hearth. Now, a fire pit is like a treasure chest. This is like where the amazing things can be found. So here is the finished excavation, the fire pit here you see is in the bottom right hand corner of this unit, okay? And of course they would find charcoal. Of course they would find fire charred rock. But how about bits of bone or teeth that are later analyzed and found to have been mountain goat? Prized, highly prized by native people because of their thick wool and their thick hides, really warm wool that created great blankets and robes. How about other bone fragments or tooth enamel that belong to hoary marmot, 
Now, everybody loves these lovable photogenic lumps, but yes, they were probably also part of the diet on the menu, early Native American people. And in terms of plants, people went to the mountain to gather all variety of plants for medicinal purposes, for technological uses, and arguably the most important plant that they sought was huckleberry. Believe it or not, well, who doesn't love huckleberries, right? And doesn't matter if you call them blueberries or mountain blueberries or huckleberries, but of course native people ate them fresh, but they also preserved them. They dried them over low burning fires or alongside a smoldering log. They would dry the berries, take them back to their lowland villages when they broke camp, and then rehydrate them over the winter months. And it turns out vitamin C is chock full in huckleberries. Huckleberries are a really important source of vitamin C. So what else did people find here? What did the people leave behind, the native people? What did they leave behind? Well, they left behind stone tools. Here are some scrapers and blades and projectile points. Here's a close up of one of the projectile points. And I've got to tell you, finding something like this, this is like, this is like finding a golden nugget as big as your head, okay? This is like getting the Nobel Prize. I've volunteered on three different digs and the majority of what we find are tiny stone slivers about the size of your little pinky fingernail sometimes from tooling and creating manufacturing tools. But these are some of the things that have been left behind by folks. So I think that gives us, you know, a pretty good idea of, you know, the original people, the Dusqualiops in the watershed. So now let's get on with our field trip itself. So uh, let's on the bus now and up at Paradise and off the bus and out to the Nisqually Vista Trail. And we are looking up the Nisqually drainage, looking north. And we're looking basically at this incredibly huge U-shaped valley that's been carved by glaciers. The next time you're up there, try to imagine it chock full of snow and ice to the very brim, hundreds and hundreds of feet high, extending way past Longmire, way beyond Ashford, all right? Here is where the river begins actually. What looks like a pile of rock debris behind that arrow is actually the tip of the, the terminus of the glacier covered with rock debris. Here's a close up. So you can see the Nisqually River. Though this is, so here's the origin of the river. All right. And I would be neglectful if I didn't take this opportunity to talk with you for a moment about the condition of the glaciers at Mount Rainier. And, and to do that, just take a look at these two side by side photographs. These were taken from the exact same location. Here's a shot of the Nisqually Glacier over 100 years ago. And use the yellow star as your point of reference, okay? Yeah. Compare that with this photo taken just a few years ago. Look again, here you go, here to here. Can you see the difference? Pretty dramatic, pretty dramatic. So the big takeaways is that all of Mount Rainier's glaciers are at their historic minimum. All of the glaciers have retreated the furthest up the mountainside since record keeping began over a hundred years ago. And as we'll see in a few minutes, there's a lot more to that story and climate change and the effects of that beyond wow. retreating glaciers. And we'll get to that in a few minutes. So let's hop from here about a mile southeast from the terminus of the glacier up into some of our favorite places in the world, right? I'm sure many folks on this call tonight uh, consider the Paradise Flower Fields one of their favorite places in the world, and they should. These are some of the most fantastic wildflower displays anywhere. In fact, one report uh, showed that over half of the people that come to Premier come just for uh, the wildflower display. I've got a little side noise in the background there. If the host could just take a look and maybe mute any microphones that are left on, that would be very helpful, please. Thank you. All right, well, so here we are in the, in the subalpine meadows at 
uh, paradise. And um, some of you uh, probably have I've volunteered for the University of Washington program that's called Metal Watch. Some of you have probably collected wildflower data and the University of Washington research team, Metal Watch, they are finding that some of the wildflowers are opening earlier in the season and staying open for longer periods of time than in prior years. Now, that sounds like good news if you're a visitor, it's going to extend the viewing season. But what you and I know about the very intricate evolutionary patterns between plants and their pollinators. So bumblebees, other insects, the uh, rufous hummingbirds, calliope hummingbirds that are found up in the meadows there. If that sequence, if that phenology, if that pattern gets thrown off a little bit, we're not sure what kind of long-term effects that's going to have on plants and pollinators. So not necessarily good news ecologically. So we've got a beautiful place. We've got a draw here of wildflowers, an incredible view. We've got wildlife. And of course, you know that with that comes a history of human impacts. Over the last hundred years or more, uh, Paradise has seen a downhill skiing operation that was uh, worked for over 40 years. At one time, you could rent a tent and camp your vacation in the meadow. Uh, there was a short-lived nine-hole golf course up at Paradise for a couple of seasons. And probably one of the most uh, damaging uh, activities at Paradise over the years were the pony rides. And years after the last horse left Paradise, there were huge ditches and trenches, you know, several feet deep and 10 feet wide, just a big mess. Well, here comes some good news that in the aftermath of all of that ecological damage, the park undertook some really fantastic restoration programs beginning in the 1980s. And you're going to love this because it has a great connection to the Washington Native Plant Society. Some of you already know this, but for those of you that don't. So now what happens is that most years, not so much this year in COVID, of course, most years, hundreds of volunteers plant thousands and thousands of native plugs into the subalpine meadows at Paradise and other locations around the mountain. Now these are seeds that are collected uh, in the same area and they are raised over the winter months in the greenhouse that the park has down at Tahoma Woods. Now here we go, greenhouses and national parks. Hopefully you know or you will know the story of Joe and Margaret Miller. These folks, my understanding, were uh, the founders or co-founders of the Native Plant Society back in the 70s. They single-handedly took on the revegetation at Cascade Pass in the North Cascades National Park. I think it's probably a fabulous story that's worth a book if it hasn't been written yet. But um, they eventually instituted a greenhouse program at North Cascades. And this model was copied at Olympic and at Mount Rainier National Park and is now at the forefront. These kind of greenhouse programs that raise plants that then go into the subalpine country, this is right at the cutting edge of this great restoration work in the high country throughout the West. Really, really cool stuff. Um, there's a really nice article in Summers 2018 Douglasia in your newsletter, summer 2018, that chronicles the timeline of Joe and Margaret Miller's involvement in the Cascades and with the Washington Native Plant Society. They were even made fellows in 1996. So it's a, it's a fabulous story, check it out. Another really great thing that came of these restoration projects was that park staff realized the best way to keep people on the trails and off the meadows is by uniformed personnel. And so they created the Meadow Rover program. These folks are volunteers working in the Sunrise area, but there's also every summer Meadow Rovers at Paradise that just interact with visitors, help people understand the fragile nature of the meadows and try to help, pe in, help people enjoy a, a great day at the mountain, uh, but at the same time being mindful of uh, the fragile environment that they're in. So back on the bus, we're gonna roll down the hill toward 
uh, toward Longmire, but I want to make a stop along the way. So this is the road coming down from Paradise. We are just above the Cougar Rock Campground, okay? And there's a wide spot to park here. We can safely get out and cross the road. And this is where Van Trump Creek comes down and empties into the Nisqually River. Now, why this is important, you'll see in just a moment. Notice the car on the roadway here. That's the Paradise Road, okay? So these creeks and rivers that flow away from glaciers, that flow from, in this case, the Van Trump Glacier or the Van Trump Permanent Snow Fields, they carry with them sediment. And you know most of this story that glaciers grind down the rock and then they carry suspended sediment in their water very natural, regular ecological process called aggradation. And at Mount Rainier throughout most of the 20th century, it was a pretty average, pretty normal accumulation, about four inches per decade of sediment accumulating on average in Mount Rainier's rivers. But then park geologist Scott Beeson made a startling discovery when he and his colleagues on a project, they found in a 10 year slot that sediment was accumulating by a factor increase of nine, three feet, 36 inches of sediment on average accumulating in Mount Rainier's rivers. Yikes, wow. How do you explain that? Well, remember we were just talked a little bit about uh, the retreating glaciers at Mount Rainier. And if you think of the snow and ice on the upper mountain as kind of like the glue that holds together glacial moraines and all of this other rock material is that snow and ice breaks up and deteriorates. That's going to allow larger and larger volumes of sediment and other rock material to move down slope. And right here at Van Trump Creek, at one time when the road was put in a hundred years ago, the road was 28 feet higher than the creek bed. Now in places, the creek bed is equal to or above the line of the road, quite a change. So what that means is you've got lots of new sediment, lots of rock material in these creek beds and river beds. What happens when you get a, a big flooding event, when you get a huge rain? Well, the classic example in November, 2006, this was the mighty flood of the century at Mount Rainier. The mountain picked up, I believe it was 18 inches of rain in a day and a half shut the park down for six months, over $20 million worth of damage. Here's the Longmire maintenance area. And it's a good thing that it, the uh, flood did not wash the emergency operation command center down the river, but it, it almost did. That would have been a big story. So uh, with these increases in aggradation, we get increases incidences in flooding, higher frequency of flooding events. Another thing that happens, if you think of we're losing the glue, the snow and ice in the upper mountain, that can allow large quantities, volumes of rock material, water and ice and snow to release spontaneously and come rushing down without any warning down these river valleys known as a debris flow or a glacial outburst flood. And one of the hot spots for this is on uh, Tahoma Creek. Now, this is up the west side road. We're pretty close to the Nisqually entrance. So we're working our way out of the park here. At one time, 50 years ago, Tahoma Creek was a narrow, mild mannered little creek. And here it is now a big braided channeled river system. Uh, notice the trees that have been battered by rock boulders and other debris coming down. Some of the standing dead trees, uh, you know, have, have drowned or had their roots been suffocated by too much sediment. So the park became really concerned because the river, the creek was kind of moving around the, however it wanted to, and it was in danger of eroding out the West Side Road. Even though the West Side Road is closed to the public, it's an important three-way for park staff in case of emergencies or other things to get up to that side of the park. So they took action and they brought in some heavy equipment. And this excavator is actually sitting on the West Side Road. Now the uh, creek, it will be to your left here. And what the excavator did was it dug out and then planted in these, what are called log bundles. These things are huge and amazing, and they slow down the flow of the creek. 
They allow it to drop its sediment a bit, actually changes the grade, if you can imagine this, the grade of the creek bed and tips the river, or as the uh, experts like to say, flip the river away from and protect the, the West Side Road in this case. Another feature of this project that was really cool, you'll be interested in, was Cruz also put in uh, walls, living walls of Sitka willow and red alder called what they call willow wattles, put these in and they're still growing to hold the soils in place. Pretty neat project up the West Side Road. So we're going to head on out of Mount Rainier National Park now, but before we do, one last stop, take a look at this. This was <laughs> the site of the Sunshine Point campground and picnic area, very near the Nisqually entrance of the park. And I think this park staff is probably wondering, where did that campground go? It was here a couple days ago. And again, flooding event, and it all got washed down the Nisqually River there. So let's leave the park, everybody back on the bus. So we've been here at Mount Rainier and our next stop is gonna be in the Eatonville area. So from here to here, but along the way, let's make sure that we make note of the 2,500 acres of varied habitat that are locked up from development in perpetuity, protected the Mount Rainier Gateway. Let's keep in mind the Nisqually Community Forest is the largest community owned forest in the state of Washington. And these are just a couple of projects of the Nisqually Land Trust. And the Land Trust, as you might know, uh, they steward, they shepherd over 7,000 acres in the watershed. They worked with other agencies to help lock up and protect over 75% of the Nisqually River shoreline from any kind of future development. And so the Land Trust is big partners with the Nisqually River Council and the oldest river council west of the Mississippi. And the last time I checked, uh, there's at least one uh, member of the Nisqually River Council uh, directory here tonight. I believe Sonny Thompson might still be serving. And I don't know if there are others, but uh, the connections between the Land Trust, the Nisqually River Council, and their cooperating agencies has just enabled them to uh, undertake just a vast array of restoration and preservation projects in the watershed. So let's take a quick look at just a few of those. Why don't we? So here's a stop at Smallwood Park in Eatonville. I believe this is on the Michelle. And this is similar to a log bundle. These are called engineered log jams. And these are, again, really great at um, stopping erosion, containing flooding, and in this case, providing great habitat for migrating salmonids. Now there's a project very close by that you might also be familiar with. This is the Ohop Creek restoration. When the dairy farmers uh, came here in the late 1800s, they saw a dairy farm. And so they uh, straightened out Ohop Creek, made it a fast running like a ditch, and over 100 years later, the Nisqually Indian tribe and a number of their partners decided to reclaim and to uh, reinstall kind of the ancestral meander of Ohop Creek. Uh, it worked out good for the dairy farmers, but it was devastating for the uh, salmon migration and for any kind of off-channel habitat for salmon. So what you see here in the foreground is a engineered log jam to slow down uh, the, the, the creek, so it's no longer fast running, it's slower moving. And of course, across the way, you see those white plastic sleeves, and I'm willing to bet there's at least a couple of people on tonight's call that were uh, helpful in installing some of those 80,000 some odd uh, native plants that went in there, that they're now grown uh, some years later and throwing shade onto the creek, uh, cooler temperatures, great conditions, and the salmon are back. So that's a real win and a real success story for everyone involved there. So let's continue to move on. So we've taken a look at a couple of projects in the Eatonville area. We're going to hop down now to Joint Base Lewis-McChord. You see this here. And you know this as the site of a joint base between the U.S. Army 
and the US Air Force. And it also happens to be the site of some of the rarest habitat in North America. Did you know that? <laughs> some of you I'm sure did. And you probably have done work here, volunteer work here at least. Uh, this is a prairie oak ecosystem. And at one time, this beautiful land stretched, stretched from Canada to Oregon. And uh, of course, most all of it has given way to development. Uh, until now, what we have is about 3%. I think about seven square miles of prairie remains. And as you can imagine, uh, the impacts on the plant and animal communities has been absolutely devastating. At my, my last count, I had 46 species of plants that were on various state or federal watch lists, threatened and endangered lists. Uh, the bird species, uh, at least one half of them have experienced either a range reduction, uh, population loss, or they've been extirpated altogether. So the challenge here is to preserve what's left, right? How do we keep and can we restore any fringe prairie land? So how do you preserve what's left? Well, if you don't know the answer, it's going to seem kind of counterintuitive because the best way it turns out to preserve the prairie lands is to let the artillery practice continue, believe it or not. It's much better than paving it over for strip malls or housing developments. And the low intensity fires that these shells generate happens to be really great for these prairie plants that have evolved to be uh, responsive to low intensity fires. So this area, Joint Base lewis McCord, uh, short name JBLM, as you know, uh, is also ground zero for some really great projects, some great restoration projects. We're gonna take a quick look at two species, and then we're gonna take a look at some kind of broader restoration projects. The Taylor's checker spot butterfly was once abundant on the prairies, and it now is uh, resident at fewer than a dozen sites. And uh, the, most of the efforts to uh, restore the numbers have been in captive breeding and uh, in captive rearing. And a lot of that has come through a unique partnership between the Evergreen State College and the Washington Department of Corrections. This is called the Sustainability in Prisons Project. And incarcerated people have raised over 18,000 Taylor checker spot butterflies and larvae that are later re, uh, released onto the prairies. And I'm telling you, when you visit the butterfly rearing facility, I find out in about five minutes that the butterflies are having as much as a, of a positive effect on the incarcerated people as they are having on the butterflies. I mean, the people love to work there. One of the women said to me, it makes me feel like we're saving their lives and they're changing ours, she said. She said, it makes me feel like the best is yet to come for them and for us. Pretty powerful. Another species project, of course, is uh, Castilea levisecta, golden paintbrush. Here's a couple of close-ups. And I just got some data in, just an hour uh, before tonight's talk, I just got some data in on some recent work with Levisecta. And uh, my good friend, Carl Elliott, who works with the Sustainability in Prisons Project. Uh, I couldn't even read everything that he sent me, but I could notice there were lots of partnering organizations and that the SPP uh, in one span, five year period, grew over 90,000 plugs of golden paintbrush, 90,000. <laughs> that, that sounds like pretty good news to me. So that's just one of 80 species of native plants that incarcerated people have learned how to uh, raise in nurseries, over two and a half million plants in the nursery and greenhouse program. Pretty impressive stuff, really a neat story. So the other thing here is Besides species specific projects, what about the system in general, the ecosystem in general? Well, this is an old growth forest, I would say, but it's not the kind that you and I know and love. Uh, it looks like an old growth forest of Scots broom. Some people call it Scotch broom, doesn't matter. It was introduced in 1850 on Vancouver Island. 
uh, by a homesick uh, Scotlander. Uh, these things, as you know, are pernicious. A single shrub has thousands of seeds and they're almost impossible to eradicate completely. Well, one of the strategies at JBLM is mowing and mowing <laughs> and mowing, all right? And another effective strategy are, is through prescribed burns. Now, as I mentioned, many native prairie plants respond favorably to low intensity fires. So this will burn out the plants, the invasives that you don't want. And you also might know that uh, there's a lot of evidence that Native American people used fire uh, to cultivate the prairies uh, in favor of the plants that were valuable and important to them. So in uh, recent years, and I think in the last decade, uh, crews have burned about an average of 1,800 acres per year in an attempt to get rid of the invasives and provide some of uh, better system-wide conditions for prairies to thrive. And here, uh, Scott's broom in the foreground, Douglas fir in the background. A Doug fir, of course, is not an invasive plant, but it's not a prairie plant and left to its own devices, it will turn a prairie uh, into a, a Doug fir forest. So let's get ready to say goodbye to JBLM and the prairies. We've been here. Let's make one more stop on tonight's field trip, shall we? Let's finish our trip down at the river mouth. Let's head down to Billy Frank Jr. Nisqually National Wildlife Refuge. I'm sure for some of you here with me, this is one of my favorite spots in the world. We're looking north here onto the estuary. Of course, I-5 is in the foreground. Uh, Olympia, uh, where some of you are catching this call from is to the left. Uh, Tacoma and Seattle area would be up to the right. And in these areas where saltwater and freshwater mix, this makes some of the richest ecosystems in the world. Literally millions of organisms live here. And in one square yard, we could find thousands and thousands of living things in the mud and muck. Also one of the best remaining examples of saltwater marsh habitat remaining here in, the, in this region. So if we were to take a look at the estuary over the ages, if we were to think back and set the time clock back and think of it thousands of years ago, even before the Nisqually villages, we might think of it as being the Delta and it's kind of what we might consider a, a natural condition before any influence or impacts from humans. And then the, uh, the coming of the people and then the coming of other people uh, European American settlers in the 19th century. And then uh, on a dismal, dismal December day in 1854, uh, signatories of Nisqually, Puyallup, Squawks, and other tribal groups affix their marks to the Treaty of Medicine Creek, which is on the grounds uh, at the refuge here. And um, they ceded over 4,000 square miles of land to the federal government. And they reserved the right to hunt and fish and gather in their usual and accustomed locations. And then uh, just after the turn of the century, a Seattle lawyer, Alson Brown, had a vision. He wanted to engage in industrial farming and turn the area into a big large scale farm. One of the first things that Brown did was he hired a crew and they built a dike. They basically drained the inner part of the estuary by building a dike, let the water drain out so that they would have a place to farm. And it, well, it worked well for the farm for a while, but it was ecologically, it was a disaster for the estuary. And Brown's farm was soon to fail, but the ecological effects would linger for over a hundred years. And then the Delta caught a huge break in 1974 with designation as Nisqually National Wildlife Refuge. And that made the Nisqually one of, we used to say the only, but now we understand there might be a couple of other rivers that begin in national parks and end 
in national wildlife refuges. So a beautiful, beautiful river, a beautiful watershed protected federally at both ends and with lots of protections in between. And then uh, another big break in 2009, the refuge, the Nisqually Indian tribe, Ducks Unlimited, of the US Fish and Wildlife Service, the US Geological Survey, on and on the number of partners that came together with the permits and the funding to actually remove the five miles of dike. 2009, with the dike removed, they were able to restore over 750 acres of estuary, basically reconnect the Nisqually River with its ancestral channels. Take a look at this before and after photograph. Now I've put a white circle around the barns here on the far right of the photograph. So you kind of have a, a little perspective frame of reference. But I want you to look inside this yellow oval. So this is before the dike was removed. Okay, and you can, you can see traces of the old ancestral paths to the left, but not much flow of water between. Once the dike was removed from here to here, here comes the oval there. Look at the changes, new channels. And this was a very, uh, photograph was taken very close to after the dike was removed. I'm told that in the ensuing years, much more sediment washed out into the sound and even more channels opened up. So as we start to wrap this up here, our field trip, and we think about now the Delta maybe on its way to moving more toward a, a, a natural condition that will never get back to its original condition, but maybe moving in the right direction. And I like to think about all of the work, all of the people, some of folks right here on this call tonight, no doubt, that have donated time and money and energy to the great projects here in the Nisqually watershed. And I think of, you know, one person who, best symbolizes the grit, the determination, the drive to, to mobilize, to get this work done. Uh, you know, the person that I land on, that I think of, of course, is Billy Frank Jr., uh, a bear hug of a man. And uh, of course, we know, knew him as a, a tribal leader and activist at local, state, federal levels. Uh, President Barack Obama uh, posthumously awarded him a Presidential Medal of Freedom. And only rightly so, uh, two years after Billy passed, was the refuge renamed Billy Frank Jr., Nisqually National Wildlife Refuge. And I'd like to close as we get back on the bus here and just read a, read a Billy Frank quote, one of my favorites. What Billy said was, I don't believe in magic. I believe in the sun and the stars the water, the tides, the floods, the owls, the hawks flying, the, the river running, the wind talking, their measurements. They tell us how healthy things are, how healthy we are, because we and they are the same. That's what I believe in. Those who listen to the world that sustains them can hear the message brought forth by the salmon. And I'll just close before we get to question and answers with a couple of public service announcements. If you like a copy of the book, it's easy to get either through my website, your favorite bookstore uh, might have a copy. Certainly they're available online as well. And I want you folks to know that I've got a couple of other talks that I love to give also. Uh, another talk is called Tahoma's Biggest Stories. And so I share more about uh, the archaeological story at Mount Rainier, the presence of native people that goes back over 9,000 years, and more about the effects of climate change at Mount Rainier. And my other talk, which I'll start giving next month, is called Special Birds of Mount Rainier, and actually focuses in on three species of birds that are protected under the Endangered Species Act. So if you're interested in those, uh, ask me back sometime. I'd be happy to talk with you about those too. And uh, last of all, if you liked these stories, um, and you'd like a, a story a month, I'll send you one. You can just go to my website, subscribe to the blog. There's no gimmick, no catch. I don't sell your email address to anyone. I just like to tell stories and share them with people. And I've got a new blog that comes out every month. So it's been a pleasure to tell these stories to you tonight. I'm going to stop sharing my screen and we'll open it up for the, uh, for the question and answers.
Thank you so much. Um, I just love going on that tour <laughs> and uh, reminding uh, myself of all the wonderful um, uh, spots to see. Um, so I'm gonna start. Uh, be sure guys to put your uh, questions in the, in the chat. And I, I've been looking for one of them. Um, so, um, oh, here's one. But um, someone was asking if Camus was um, in that watershed. So maybe you could talk about Camus on the prairies there. In sure enough, and I can't, I can't believe I just didn't even mention Camus tonight, right? <laughs> yeah. I, just get, I just get so wrapped up in talking about other stuff. You never know what's gonna get left, left out or what's gonna make the cut. But uh, yeah, so, and this was one of the many plants that Willie Frank talked to researchers about was that camas was uh, really important to native people and it's in Lewis and Clark it's in Lewis and Clark's journals it's in uh, David Douglas's journals and uh, it, in fact it needed needed to be cooked very carefully roasted carefully in pit ovens and both Lewis and Clark and David Douglas said if it's not cooked right bad gas is the result bad gas <laughs> <laughs> great um, so, um, there's a question from Kevin and he says, um, can you tell us since Billy Frank has passed, how is the relationship between the Nisqually people and JBM, BLM, uh, is going, um, how is it going these days? I may not be an expert to answer that question, but I can tell you that the level of engagement on both sides is still very high, that JBLM is, continues to be super committed to the restoration projects. And I would, I would only imagine that the relationship between the tribe and JBLM is, is as strong as ever. So there's lots of comments about how great the presentation is. And uh, Gail would like to know the title of the book again. Yeah, so the title of the book is Tahoma and Its People, published by WSU Press this spring, Tahoma and Its People. And that's, that's what's in my background, right? So this was a shot taken by one of the researchers at the Nisqually Prairies. And as I said, Tahoma, <laughs> No real agreement on what the, what Tahoma means. It might mean snow covered peak, might mean source of all waters, um, but uh, it, it's a it's a great word to describe a beautiful mountain, isn't it? Okay. Um, so there was, you know, I think at the end when we get done with Q and A, I'll have you uh, re-show that last page with the uh, website. Sure, I'm happy yeah. to do that. Have yeah, that. that would be good. Um, um, where does the sustainability and prisons project do work currently? Do they do work with plants, creatures beyond the ones we heard about tonight? Absolutely. So they actually, I believe, they started with Oregon spotted frog, done some work with the. Is it the Portland, Portland Zoo? Um, Sustainability in Prisons Project, I think has programs in almost all of the state's correctional facilities. So are there maybe, are there a dozen total and they have like programs in 10 of those facilities? So uh, uh, recycling, um, all nature. I think if you just go to the Sustainability in Prisons project website, you can get turned on to some of the work that they're doing. It's pretty impressive and comprehensive. Lots more than just what I talked about tonight. Uh, Gail, I'm looking at a question here from Andy uh, asking about if there are any programs to remove invasives like Scotch broom along the upper Nisqually River, upper Nisqually area. Thanks Andy for your question. Um, I have been a, a member of a few scotch broom pulling parties that have been uh, sponsored by the Nisqually Land Trust. And of course, in these days of the virus, I don't know, you know what they're doing in terms of 
social distancing and you know if they're waiting until we get on the other side of the virus. But you might check with the Nisqually Land Trust, look at their website and see pulling scotch broom is a gas. Those weed wrenches are so big and powerful, it really makes you feel like a superhero. So uh, it's really good to do. Great. Um, so just lots of comments on um, the presentation, how much oh, people enjoy yeah, it. So thank you, thank you much. Yeah, thank and thank you. Um, I think. Looks like that's about it. Huh? Oh, I'm okay. kind of scrolling through here. Yeah, I know. I always have to scroll. Uh, oh, I'm have to. Oh, check the Q&A. OK. So I forget about doing that. Um, how far up the Nisqually River did the salmon venture into what is now the National Park and what species? Well, again, my standard disclaimer, I'm not a fisheries biologist or when we're talking about geology, I say, I'm not a geologist. Um, so my understanding is that the older dam, it, you know, has, it has blocked the, the, the passage uh, of fish beyond that. Um, however, um, there may be, I'd have to check, there may be some populations of bull trout in the Nisqually. There are some, pop, there are some populations of bull trout in the Carbon River up above the Carbon Falls. So the populations that have been there for hundreds or thousands of years. So I'm not sure if there are anadromous fish, bull trout or others up above the dam. I just don't know. Uh, and then there's a question, uh, any increase in the salmon population or other wildlife populations? Oh, down low, like the projects that we visited. So Ohop Creek is one of the two salmon bearing tributaries of the Nisqually River. It's just Ohop and the Michelle River, right? And so the data after they restored the meander at Ohop Creek and they put all those plants in, the data was just terrific in terms of salmon returning and using Ohop Creek as off-channel habitat. Same is true at the refuge now that the dike is out and the numbers are very favorable for increases in anadromous fish down and starting to come up the Nisqually. Okay, um, what is the ongoing effect of the Alder Dam? Well, it generates electricity <laughs> for, was it 40 or, 40 or 50,000 uh, folks? Um, people always ask, will it be a catch basin if there is a massive debris flow that comes down the Nisqually, uh, which could happen? Uh, would it be a catch basin for some of the debris from a debris flow or a glacial outburst flood? It, it could be. Um, I, I don't know. It, it, this would be a good group to ask. I haven't heard any talk of the Nisqually dams, the, the Legrand or the Alder dams coming down. I don't know if anybody knows anything about that, but it doesn't sound to me like those things are on the radar. Uh -huh. And uh, just uh, feedback, um, Sunny, who uh, volunteers with the uh, Nisqually Land Trust says they're still working and it's mask on. Yes. So, so you. just definitely check out um, the Nisqually Land Trust if you're looking for some opportunities to volunteer. Yeah, thank you, uh -huh. Sunny. And also Sunny said, and, it, and the Busy Wild. So the Busy Wild Creek, I believe is the headwaters of the Michelle and the Busy Wild <laughs> is in the, um, it, uh, not in the community forest, but it's in the, uh, the uh, other area that outside of Ashford that's protected now. And side note, Sonny, I think I know your son from our days at Mount Rainier many years ago together. <laughs> okay. Um, Gail Scholar is asking about um, techniques for removing Scotch broom. And she had heard that cutting it back is better method of removal. Hmm. I don't know compared to what, but um, have you any, what are your, you mentioned several different strategies. So I, you know, taking it from the experts and I would call the folks at the land trust among the experts, you know, yanking it out, you know, with a weed wrench, 
People mow, so that would be the uh, essentially the same as cutting it back. It grows back, um, burning it. So, you know, the prescribed burns. People use herbicides. All of these things are not enough to completely eradicate it. It's just a, it's just a very persistent uh, plant that, that's just really hard to get rid of altogether. But those are some of the things that people have adapted, have adopted to try to get rid of it. <laughs> Sonny says here that the roots, the roots of the Scots bloom go straight to hell. I know I always get excited when I get a really long root pulled out. Um, uh, do you know if Mount Rainier archaeologists were able to find identifiable plant remains at the sites of in the park? Yep, absolutely. And again, one of the things I just get long-winded and don't talk about everything. So um, some of the plant remains that have been found in the fire hearths, for example, are, of course, uh, huckleberry seeds white bark pine nuts, hazelnuts. Uh, interesting if there are any birders, bird watchers in the group um, that also have found g gizzard stones from grouse. And a gizzard, you know, that's the kind of the, the, the muscular stomach that grinds up hard seeds and stuff. Well, they eat grit. And so they have also found gizzard stones in these fire hearths. But those are the main plants that I know of huckleberry, white bark, pine nuts, and hazelnuts. All of those things have to be charred, charcoal charred to be preserved. Otherwise the acidic soils would just completely like no cedar baskets would ever be found because uh, they just decay in the acidic soils too quickly. Um, so um, what other rivers start in a national park and end in the National Wildlife Refuge? Oh, there was a great argument a couple of last year when someone from the Squally said, you know, the only river. And um, some, and there were two. That someone said the Dungeness, the Dungeness River begins in the refuge and ends at Olympic National Park. And I can't, can't remember the one in Alaska. There's one in Alaska. I made a note. I can't remember what it is. So uh, there are at least three. So it's homework for people to go find those other ones. Good treatment. Um, <laughs> uh, oh, um, so uh, what is the impact of ivy? Oh boy, I bet there's other people here that could answer that better than me. It's a power, right? I mean, yeah, ivy, English ivy, another real troublemaker, chokes trees. Yeah, I've been in those in the Squally Reach area and I have ivy everywhere. So it's uh, I wherever it, it drops, wherever those little seeds gets dropped, it will be. But uh, do you know of uh, any uh, specific um, restoration along the Squally that focuses on that? I don't, yeah. but someone here might. And I'm sorry, folks, I guess there's a little bit of feedback that I'm hearing too, I apologize for that. Um, um, okay, so yeah, they're, they're thinking that it's my machine and the world. Um, there's also um, a listing for broombusters.org. Yeah. Probably would tell you more things about that. Yeah. Um, uh, I think we are very close to the end of the questions. Oh, you um, be, show slides again. Yeah. Do you want to do that? Share your, uh, that final screen of yours with the book and the, where to get it. That yeah, give, great. give, give me a second to, to do that. Um, okay. I'm getting it up right now. All right. So give me a second. And so there's how to get a copy of the book, the title of the book, how to get it, and my website. Also, if you wanted to subscribe to the blog, I'll send you a story for January.
So Gail, I think you need to give me permission to share my screen. Gail, are you there? <laughs> Can you, um, when I hit share screen, okay. Now, Deb, I made you a co-host, you should be fine. I share my screen, I'm not seeing my screen, I'm seeing, oh, okay. Uh, I see, thank you. Got it. Oops, okay. So uh, Gail asked me to share a few slides from my uh, hike this summer. My husband and I have been section hiking the PCT trail, uh, Pacific Crest Trail for about four years now. And uh, this summer we had planned to go to the Sierras but that did not work out <laughs> because of the pandemic. We decided to stay closer to home. So we, um, uh, one of the hikes we took along the PCT this summer was uh, along the Goat Rocks area. And I imagine a lot of you have been up here. And um, anyway, it's just a pretty fabulous place for plants. When I go backpacking, I like to go as light as possible. So I don't bring any uh, I don't bring a camera and I don't bring any plant books. I just bring my phone, take pictures with my phone and I download a PDF of the most pertinent plant list from the, whoops, sorry, my head here. Um, the most pertinent plant list from the um, Washington Native Plant Society, the plant lists website, highly recommend that. Uh, I also have the Washington Wildflower app on my phone and you can get that um, from highcountryapps.com. Then after the hike, I go back through my photos and try to uh, zero in on uh, what I saw using the fabulous Burke Herbarium image collection. So um, the first hike that my husband and I did on the PCT was in Southern California and we hiked through the deserts in, in Southern California and saw many species of Calicordus, uh, which is just a gorgeous genus overall. And um, so as we started this year, we started from Walloped Lake and we're hiking up to Sheep Lake for our first overnight. Um, along the trail, uh, all along the trail it was dotted with these gorgeous mountain mariposa lilies and um, it just seemed like a really wonderful welcome back to the trail to me from those beautiful flowers. So on the second day of our hike, we got up to Cispus Basin, which was, at, we just hit it at the height of the flowering time. This was mid-August, I think it was August 13th. And um, it was as though the basin were filled to the brim with these flowering plants and the scent of lupin was just intoxicating. <clears throat> the bear grass was in full bloom and there are just clumps uh, here, there and everywhere with um, these beautiful blossoms that look, to me, they look like fireworks going off in the sky. The interesting thing about the bear grass is we saw it later um, about two days later when we walked through a burnt over area that was just all um, dead snags and um, just charred earth. And here coming up through the ash, the only green thing were um, clumps of bear grass. So that was very interesting in looking at how, you know, how, how recovery from fire um, takes place. So um, I was trying to take this shot of this pretty uh, coiled bee louse wart um, and, you know, try to get a really artsy picture with the 
the jagged peaks in the background. <laughs> Here's the downside of being a click and go botanist. Uh, and also the, the sunglasses and, the, and just using my phone as the camera. I didn't really realize till I got home that I'd been photobombed by the uh, mountain bistort. <laughs> so that tells me, you know, take an extra minute or two to make sure that you have what you want in your picture and what you don't want is not in there. So, um, Towards the end of the second day of hiking, we crossed the knife, which is, as you can see, kind of a, a steep ridge. Um, I'd heard all sorts of horror stories about how treacherous this crossing is, but when we got there in mid-August, there was no snow. We did have to cross a, a couple steep snow slopes on the way there. You can see this is actually at the end of the ridge looking back the way we had come. And at that far ridge, you can see there's some steep patches of snow to cross. But overall, it was just a lovely stroll through this fabulous uh, fell field filled with these hardy alpine plants. So um, here's another um, uh, warning for the uh, click and go botany that I try to do, which is I took this picture of these, this pretty clump of Castilea thinking, oh, when I get back home, I'll figure out what that was. Well, for Castilea especially, there are many uh, genus like this, but especially Castilea, you need to take note of a few key characteristics to be, really get it down to species again. So we'll just call this Castilea spa. Um, oh, this was so, so thrilling. I had seen uh, again oh, yeah. on the Goat uh, Mountain, um, the Goat Mountain, or I'm sorry, not the um, Goat Rocks plant list, which actually, by the way, I meant to mention the Goat Rock plant list that is on the NPS website is just fabulous. It's compiled from several different sources, including four backpacking trips of the Native Plant Society. So it's really a solid list and it was a great help. And I saw in there that this uh, rough bellflower, this uh, particular campanula was on the list. And so I was so thrilled to find it in this fell field as we crossed the knife. It, it's just a, just a beauty. And then um, here's this whole field of sort of gray, brown, boring rock. And then these pops of pink, uh, this cushioned buckwheat was just gorgeous in that setting. I just admire it. It just is hanging on in the most uh, extreme environment and, and seems to be blooming and thriving. Okay, well, um, and the, we had four days after the knife. We had two more days traveling through the goat rocks and uh, we went through some more gorgeous subalpine meadows, another scree slope that was dotted all over with the pink um, cushion buckwheat. And we went over through that burnt area that I mentioned um, and finally ended up coming down through the forest uh, adjacent to the White Pass ski area, which was fun because that's a place I like to ski and it was fun to see it in the summer looking down on the slopes and uh, eventually hit Highway 12 and completed our, our hike through. So that's all I had. Are we ready, Gail, or should I keep? Talking. Um, I, I have. Oops, I can't hear you. Oh, there we go. There we go. Um, keep chatting a bit. Uh, actually, I, I will. What I'll just say is, um, if you guys want to turn on your mics and your cameras. Um, 
we can just chat some more. I have six more people that I need to let, let in. Okay. And it's like, uh, well, I just wonder, has anyone else been up in the um, Go Rocks area? And um, I'm sure you've all found some, some pretty fabulous sites. And, uh, you know, you don't have to do it as a four day backpack. You, it's, um, there's a loop that I might even be able to do in one day, but you could certainly do it in uh, one overnight that gets you up to that Cispus Basin that's just filled with wildflowers. It's just a, a really gorgeous place. Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, Deb, I love the Goat Rocks. I've gone uh, many, many times there. It's one of my favorite spots to go. And um, Conrad Basin and um the goat lake and the beautiful um Cispus basin from mm -hmm. i've been both places on the boat um going over from conrad there's a old trail that goes there it's just beautiful um lots of beautiful flowers and beautiful scenery and just beautiful. Yeah, that was my first time there. I, I don't know why I hadn't been before because it is absolutely my favorite part of the PCT that we've done so far. So. Yeah. I've never been well, there. Can you talk about where it is and how you get there? Oh, sure. So, um, uh, it so we went out of Walloped Lake, um, so that is um, out of Randall, in kind of the Randall area. Um, I don't know the Forest Service Road. I can't remember. I don't recall the number that you go down. But I think if you just looked up hikes uh, to, I think you could just go to the Washington Trails Association, which is a fabulous place and just put in um, goat rocks. And there's several, several options. You can even start at White Pass and hike south. Um, so we stopped, started at Walloped Lake and, and hiked north and went through that area. And then, like I said, there's, there's also a loop up. Um, that's from another lake that I'm not remembering the name of, but um, okay. yeah, Washington Trail Association would be great. Would you like me to say some things? Sure. Um, if you go to Berry Patch, it's about a five mile backpack into Snowgrass Flat. Oh, right. And, and then you, I, I've spent maybe 20 times there and um, I stay there for three nights one day trip into Cispus Basin, one day trip uh, to Old Snowy, and then another one to um, Goat Lake and the Hawkeye Pass, Hawkeye Peak area. And every everyone is filled with flowers. Usually you said mid-August, it really depends. Sometimes on my birthday, which is July 10th, uh, I've been up there with beautiful flowers mm -hmm. and sometimes it's all in the snow. So you just have to keep looking at other places. Thank you. You're welcome. Hey Deb, somebody was wondering what the bugs were like in August. I don't recall any problems with bugs. <laughs> so it, it, it might've been, um, we, oh, we had some bugs, we camped near a spring. So we should have known better than that. Um, in kind of a low wet area one night and there were some bugs there, but up high, we weren't bothered by bugs at all. So Gail, I, I can't hear you. I, I see you're talking.
talking. Thank you. Can you see me talking? I was just going to say, if there's anything else, anybody else that they want to share or, you know, things that are happening that you want people to know about, um, please, this is a good time to, um, to share. I thought I'd follow up with one thing after our uh, fabulous.